Uh, welcome everyone uh, to this, the uh, third day of our uh, Lunch and Learn uh, series. Um, so uh, let me just give you a little bit of the practical details of how this is going to work today. Um, th this is sort of a, uh, I think it's what we should call a presentation sandwich. Um, I am the bread and butter that you're going to find on both ends of the sandwich. And in the middle of the sandwich will be the delicious filling of brine may. So on either side, I, I'm going to be uh, giving some tips on embedded SQL. And, um, and then uh, Brian will be giving his presentation on creating and managing uh, the API, the profound API uh, on IBM I. Um, Again, just a couple of more practical details. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, if you can just drop them into the Q&A. So please, for questions, use the Q&A button on the bottom, uh, not the chat. Uh, if you're having some technical issues, like the sound isn't right or something like that, um, if you can just drop those into the, um, into the chat, and my colleague John Paris will be keeping an eye on that there uh, as well. Um, now, we will be leaving a little bit of time at the end uh, for a Q&A session, and that can be either questions for me and or Brian. Um, Brian's colleague, Mike Pavlak, is also going to be keeping an eye on the Q&A. And so if people have questions in there, Brian, um, Mike may be able to answer them directly for you uh, in the Q&A as we go along. So without further ado, uh, let's start. Um, what I've tried to do is grab some of my uh, favorite um, embedded SQL tips uh, to share with you. Uh, so hopefully one or two of these are things that you, you uh, may not have come across or haven't come across uh, before. Um, sir, uh, these just a quick list of the topics I'm going to be touching on. Um, so let's start with the one I tell everybody what is one of the real keys to using embedded SQL on IBM I, and that's making use of views. Um, so by the way, this SQL that you see here in front of you is a standard bit of embedded SQL from an RPG program. Well, I say standard, I mean standard as in I see this type of SQL a lot uh, out there uh, embedded in programs. Uh, by the way, this in my company is what we call a firing offense. If, if I saw this embedded SQL, you get fired. Uh, before anybody panics about getting me firing people, I would like to point out that in my company, I'm the only employee. Uh, I will tell you, I have fired myself about six times. Julie realized the mistake I made and just hired myself straight back again, of course, with, with a pay increase. So. The point about I'm trying to make here is that one of the things you never want to see in an RPG program is complicated SQL. Um, if I have an, an SQL statement that I need to debug, um, well, I'd sooner be debugging it outside of my RPG program than in my RPG program. So instead of this, really what I should have done was create a view. So taking all of the complex bit that you see in the SQL and just putting that in a view. And then what I'm gonna see in my RPG program is this very simple select statement down here. So usually what this means is that, you know, perish the thought, but if there was a problem with my SQL, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I can't keep a straight face when I say things like that, but imagine that a problem with my SQL. But if there was a problem with my SQL, I would much sooner be trying to figure out that that problem was in the view and the construct of the view than in my program. It also means that to fix it, well, all I got to do is change the view and I can test all of that outside my program. And usually 99 out of 100 times, I don't even have to recompile the RPG program to fix my SQL problem. Okay. Now, before anybody gets any um, sort of uh, thoughts about, oh, but aren't views and overhead and all of that. Um, there is no overhead to using a view, none. There is no maintenance overhead to using a view. There is no runtime overhead to using a view. In other words, the length of time it takes for, uh, for me to run this embedded SQL statement against that view or to run this SQL statement here is the exact same length of time. 
there is no difference between the two. Okay. Um, so next tip, how many rows are in a result set? So if ever you've seen uh, this little guy on a web page, you know, something that says this, I'm showing you 51 to 100 of 372. Where do you get the 372 from? How do you figure this out? Now you've got two ways of doing it. And one of the ways most people do it is they'll use a second SQL statement. They'll do a select count and they'll have the same where clause uh, shoved in there that they're going to have on the actual declaration of the cursor or whatever that they use. And by the way, sometimes that is still going to be the way that you want to do it. Okay, just to be aware of that. Now, the other way of doing this though, is to figure it out directly after opening your cursor. So the way that this works is that after opening the cursor and I'm immediately after opening the cursor, you ex and execute an SQL statement called get diagnostics. Now get diagnostics is a very, very powerful uh, little beast. Um, it can be used by the way to return anything that you'll find in the SQL communications area. All of that information that's in there like SQL code, SQL state, all of that information you can grab if you want using get diagnostics, you know, if you wanted to go that way. There are, if I, I think, approximately like a hundred different things that you can pick up with get diagnostics. But one of the things that you can pick up is the number of rows. Now, this is a, a set of predefined, if you want to think of them this way, of named constants that SQL has. And this one here, db2 underscore number underscore rows, will give me the total number of rows that are in the result set. Okay, so we just uh, use this with the get diagnostics and we say host variable, which obviously has to be a numeric variable, equals that. And I now have the total number of rows in the result set. Now there is one caveat with this, for get diagnostics to work with this uh, DB2 number of rows. And that is that when you declare the cursor, you have to declare it as an insensitive cursor. Now, a lot of people aren't aware of this, but cursors are very sensitive by nature. Their default is they are sensitive little beasts. So you be careful what you say to a cursor, because yeah, you can hurt its feelings very, very easily, okay? So the point about this though, is that an insensitive cursor um, means that you're sending the optimizer down a certain path. You're telling it, how it's to process uh, your declaration, okay? So, um, so let me put it like this. Normally, if you have a sensitive cursor, what happens is the optimizer starts to do its work and figure out what the result set is. And when it's figured out usually what about the first 50 rows in the result set are, it sends a message back to your program that says, by the way, you can start reading the result set now. Okay, so as you're pulling those 50 rows in, it's adding more rows to the result set, yeah? But if I say it's an insensitive cursor, what I'm telling it is, don't tell me that I can start pulling back rows until you have figured out all of the rows in the result set. So this can lead to a delay, yeah? So it can be longer before I can retrieve that first row. Now, usually, you know, if I do that, well, then I might be best going back to using a select count. But between the two, this is the one that I always try first. And then if I find, hmm, it's a little bit slow, well, then I'll, I'll see if the select, uh, the select count will work faster, okay? But whichever floats your boat. Okay. You know all of those beautiful SQL functions that you have out there? You know, all 200 plus of them. I know a lot of them, they're, they're duplicates of what you have in RPG, you know? So things like substring and trim, like we have those in RPG, but SQL ha ha has another whole bunch of them. But you can use any of those as, well, sorry, most of those scalar functions directly in RPG. You don't uh, you know, need to be selecting from a file or anything like that. You can use them 
directly. And by the way, there are two ways, two different ways that you can do it. Two different, or sorry, two different syntaxes. I'm sorry, is that the plural of syntax? Or is it, is it syntacti or syntaxes? Wh whichever. There are two ways that you can do it. Two are the number of ways, are the syntaxes that you can use. Okay, so very simply, you can use either values into or set equal. So just to show you a, a few simple examples of this, um, uh, the second one here, uh, values, the upper of the host variable my name into the host variable my name. So whatever is in my name gets converted to uppercase. In this case, it would be my name, Paul, and it would end up as uppercase P-A-U-L. Um, uh, something like getting the day, uh, the day of a week, um, the day of a week in ISO format, the day of a year. Okay, so this syntax can be used with any scalar function. By the way, you can do this in run SQL scripts as well. Um, you know, if you want to see, you know, just check how a function works, you don't have to select from a table. You can just say values and put in uh, the function uh, with a value and it will show you the answer. Yeah, you, you don't have to do a full select. So this is one syntax um, of using values into. Uh, the other is just to use set. So you can say set, you know, variable equals. And this is sort of more the SQL syntax. So if you're used to writing SQL, like, you know, stored procedures and that, you might be a bit more used to, to, to using set. For what it's worth, personally of the two of these, um, I prefer to use values into. And the only reason that I prefer to use values into is that whenever I see set, I have to look at it twice because set is used in multiple ways in SQL. So for example, you've got set options, which is used to set the environment for, uh, for SQL. So, uh, but sorry, a small thing, either of them work absolutely perfectly. Um, now th think about this though, that if I can do that, if I can do that, you know, you know, just use any SQL function, well, why not wrap uh, SQL functions in um, uh, uh, an RPG procedure? Okay, so here's an example of that upper one. So you pass it in some text, it converts it to uppercase and returns the text. Yeah, so now I've taken an SQL function and made it look like an RPG BIF. So if I take those functions and like that function and put it out in a service program, I don't even have to have an embedded SQL program to be using embedded SQL. I just call an SQL function that's sitting out in a service program somewhere. So I can take these and, and wrap them. Now, now just think about this though, that if you take things something like using an upper, this is a lot easier than using percent x relation or PG, what you're, you know, you're from and your two strings. Think about things like you want to figure out what the day of a week is. Well, you know, instead of writing a function to do the math to figure that out and then have an array with the day names, just use that function for it. How about using something like the regular expression functions that SQL has, as opposed to using the regular expression APIs? By the way, if ever you've never used the regular expression APIs, uh, actually Brian and Mike, your colleague, Scott Clement, is the guy who one set of those APIs, I don't find them the easiest to use. Scott Clement said that about the APIs, which means the rest of us are sunk. We, we don't have a hope of using those suckers. And um, the encrypt decrypt functions, again, instead of using the encrypt decrypt APIs, are, are, if you want to use something like Soundex, yeah, well, there is no equivalent of Soundex. You want to do something like Soundex? Well, you use, you do Soundex and SQL. There, there is no, no, no true equivalent of it. So, so all you got to do is go and write this service program. Now, I know I can't see all of you people, but, but I know exactly what's going on at the moment. You're all sitting there going, oh yeah, I, I could do that. And you're not going to. Not a hope, you're, you're just gonna to get too busy, it's okay. So I'll tell you what, I've already done it. You can just go to our website, there's the link. That's where you can download it. And there you will find the wrappers for all of these uh, SQL functions. Okay, 
Now, just very briefly, and then I'll hand over to, to Brian. One of these uh, uh, isn't in, in the wrappers there, but another thing, just since we're talking about functions, is that there are functions out there uh, which will consume web services. Now, these are non-standard DB2 functions. You will find them in every version of DB2, but they are not considered official uh, supported DB2 scalar functions. Uh, this is an article, by the way, I wrote of a number of years ago, and it actually shows uh, RPG doing language translation. And just, this is language translation on a green screen uh, by calling one of the Watson uh, language translation APIs. And this is just showing you the code behind it. And by the way, there is a link to the article, but I have to tell you the article is out of date. IBM changed their website since I wrote that article. Uh, so you would need to look at the article and this little snippet of code if you want to try it. So uh, you have to use this function down here called HTTP post club. In other words, I, when I wrote the article, I was using one called get club, um, but that no longer uh, works on the, uh, the Watson site. Okay, so uh, without further ado, um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here and I'm gonna hand it over to that marvelous filling uh, Brian May. So oh, and over Mr. to you, Tui, Brian. Before, before you disappear, Paul, and mute yourself, there is a question that needs uh, you to address in the Q&A. Uh, okay. Well, you don't started... need to talk about it now, but just okay. it needs addressing. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Over to you, Brian. All right. Thank you, Paul. So I've got a lot to talk about and not a lot of time to to do it. So we're going to jump right in. And Mikey's nodding his head because he knows that I have a lot to talk about. So um, <clears throat> what we're going to talk about is our brand new offering called Profound API. Um, it was officially released on Friday. So this is the absolute freshest of offerings from Profound Logic. And it's my baby. Um, I can't claim I wrote it. Um, but I am the product owner of it, um, and I, it, I'm the one that kind of uh, spearheaded the, the effort to build this product. So um, if we get into the, the specifics, I'm not going to do many slides. I hate slides, um, but we're going to do a quick one here, though. Um, so the idea behind Profound API is, is we've taken the idea of API on IBM I, or honestly on any type of platform, and we decided to simplify it. Um, so it is, as the slide says here, it is designed from the ground up to make creating, managing, and deploying API simple. That's the, that's the mission statement of Profound API. So what does that mean? It means we're gonna be able to create API without writing a single line of code. We're gonna be able to expose our existing IBMI resources, whether they be programs, sub procedures, um, data areas, DB2 data, all of that is going to be easily accessible as API. Um, we're going to be able to access not only our IBMI resources, but we're gonna be able to consume other API that are outside of IBMI. We're gonna be able to reach out to other databases. Um, the reality is, is while you know, our core systems are most likely running on IBMI, we likely have other systems in our enterprise and we need to be able to actually integrate with those systems. And this is gonna allow us to do that. Um, we're gonna be able to deploy these API very simply. If you can click save, you can deploy an API. And uh, not to mention, it's going to document it for us. I know all of you are just great at writing documentation about your applications. Um, actually, I know you won't do it. Uh, much like Paul said, you wouldn't go and write the, uh, the service program for his scalar functions. Uh, Developers are terrible at, at documenting what we've done. Profound API just handles it for you. You don't have to do the do documentation. Um, and again, API is a new concept for a, lot of, for a lot of shops. So we have things like our performance dashboard that's going to actually give you a place to go and take a look and try to figure out, is my API server running well? Are my APIs performing well? Um, all of that's been simplified so that we can, so that you don't have to think about it. So. That's enough PowerPoint for now. Uh, let's actually jump in and take a look at this stuff because it's all about the stuff. Um, I'm going to flip something over here on my other screen so I can monitor it. Um, 
because I actually have um, some things running over here just uh, to build some performance data. So Profound API is built on top of Profound JS, our Node.js solution for IBM I. Um, <clears throat> so it is an entirely Node solution. All of the tooling runs in your browser. There are no fat clients to have to deal with. If you've got a web browser, you can log into Profound API and start building API. So let's take a quick look at what creating an API could be. Um, let's just say I have some data on my IBM I sitting out in DB2. And let's say, you know what, uh, my .NET team called and said, hey, we want to access that data, but I don't want to give them direct access to my database. I'd like to give them an API layer to inter interface with. Not a problem. So I'm inside of our IDE here. I can switch over to my database tab and you'll see all of the database connections I have uh, configured here. You'll see I'm running on IBM I right now. Um, I have, so I have my local IBM I instance. I could also have remote IBM I instances. Um, you'll also notice I have a, a MariaDB instance configured running out in AWS and I have a SQL Server and Azure configured here too. So we can talk to anything, but let's just hop down and let's take a look and let's look at a PO detail file. Great. So I need an API layer for this table. Okay. I'm going to right click on that table. I'm going to choose build API. Okay, we're done. Uh, it's, it's gone out. It's retrieved all of the information about this table and it has built a full API layer um, for this table. And I'm going to move these cameras out of my way. Um, so you'll see I have a list of routes here. So I have a, an API called PO details to retrieve the list of all of the all of the detail records. Um, it also has parameters that are set up here. You can see you can put in a selection or a filter, all of those things to narrow that. Obviously, you don't want to retrieve a million row table, although technically it will let you. Um, <clears throat> or I have a route here to retrieve one. So I can use PO details and pass the um, RRN is the name of the, of the column in this table. So I can pass that in as part of my path and retrieve that single one. I have add, I have update, I have delete, all of the, all of the different API that I might need uh, to interact with this table. So all I need to do at this point, I mean, obviously there's more I could do, but we're, all I need to do at this point is just click save. Give it a name, I'll just leave it at the default. It named it after the detail file puts it in a, in a file called podetails.api.json. So obviously it's a JSON file. Save it, it's deployed. At this point, this, this, these API are deployed on this server, my test server that I'm running on. If I wanna test them, I can come right here in my IDE to my test tab here and give it a spin. Um, this particular one, I don't even know an RRN number, so we'll guess. There it is. Uh, I guess I didn't choose one with data. Let's try one. Do we have an, an RRN of one? No, we don't. So I guess we can do this then. Let's go get a list and limit me to 10. Perfect. But I don't have to have extra tooling to do this testing and to interact with these API. It's all right here. So I have an RRN of 1001. Perfect. So I can go to get one. We can tell it I want 1001. There we have it. There's my data. Um, again, I haven't written a single line of code. I've written, just pointed and clicked my way through this. And what's really cool is that you also will notice here that even in our testing tab, let's say you want to test this from a command line. Here's, here's the curl command to go out and run tests against this. Or if I want to run this in the browser, well, here's the URL. I can just copy it, drop it in a tab, and there it is. So no matter what your testing tools that you like to use, um, you can get the information you need to be able to do those tests or you can just use the testing tab that's built right here into the IDE. So 
just to give you a quick overview of the of the different functions we have in here you'll notice obviously we had our database tab and our file listing here this is from my ifs on my ibm at this at this point and let me um, on the bottom here you'll see i have a place to define my input parameters and my output um, again it's all point and click if i needed a new parameter all i need to do is choose to add one give it a data type and fill out the basic information about what it is um, i have all these routes that are within this one json file um, so i can create new routes uh, delete routes deprecate routes um, you'll notice if we take a look at the general info there's all kinds of ways to categorize and write descriptions about these api i mentioned that it that it self documents it does all you have to do is just fill in the the fields and the forms here that the that the tool gives you um, cores don't worry about cores we've got that taken care of by default here if for some reason you don't want it turned on turn it off um, you can deprecate and disable api all of these things can be done without having to restart an api server um, it's just a json file which means that when you get ready to deploy these things into production it's just a json file so whatever your devops strategy is if it's just typical ibm i change management well can it handle an ifs file then it can move it to production um, if it if you have a more sophisticated devops strategy you're using git or you know Jenkins, all of the Ansible, all of those things. If you have a really automated continuous integration, continuous deployment environment, it's a JSON file. All you have to do is get the new JSON into the, into the production environment and the server will pick that up and those API are now deployed. So we have a lot of um, baked in functionality there. So you just don't have to worry about it. Um, also, you'll notice here in, in the center, um, that's where the, the magic happens. Um, Profound API uses our new low code development strategy. So everything inside of here is done with low code. I'm not going to use this one as our example because I have some more interesting ones. Um, so let's say we wanted to call an RPG program. It's fine. I don't have to know how to code that in Node.js to make it happen. All I need to do is come here and you'll see I have a step here that I've called call IBMI program. I'm not really creative with the names. But I can show you here, if we go to edit, I'm just answering questions. All right, what do I want to do? Well, I want to call an IBMI program. All right, where is it? So here it is. All right, give me, give me the parameter listing. All right, well, the first one's a packed decimal. It's nine and zero. And I'm going to pull the value that I pass in from my input parameters. I had one called claim ID. So that's what I want. Um, if I were capturing data from this parameter, like in the in the ones here, um, I'll use the API output property. And I'll, in this case, I'm just dropping them in output parameters. You can see I have an output parameter called description and date and county. Um, but all I have to do is just describe the interface to this RPG program or sub procedure if, if that's what we want to do. You'll notice the data types, we have all of the typical IBMI data types, including data structures, um, dates and times, all of those things. So you don't have to worry about data translation and formatting them properly for the RPG program to be able to understand them. All of that's handled. So I have call the RPG program. I have an additional step here where I am just setting some property values for my output. I had some output parameters here that were not part of the original, uh, that were not part of the return values from the program. So for example, I set a status success to true. Um, I had in demoing this previously, I created one called Bob. It's not there anymore, but I'm putting was here in there. Um, whatever it is you'd like to do. Um, you can do all of that without a single line of code. And again, we can come here and test that. And there we have our, our response from our RPG program. Now we can get really complicated with this if we want. I say complicated, it's really not that complicated. I have a single API here where we're calling that RPG program. I'm retrieving some data from, it says MySQL, it's actually from MariaDB, running in AWS. And then I'm going to retrieve some DB2 data, uh, again, from my IBMI. 
And then I'm going to take the output that I got from those things and stick all of that into my output parameters here for this for this API. Um, it's really just a matter of just adding steps and retrieving the data I want. So again, the same program call we had before. I want to retrieve some data from AWS. It's not a problem. All I need to do is say I need a set of database records. Uh, which database do I want to access? I have a list of all of the different connections that I have configured. All right, what columns? All I have to do is check boxes. All right, what about my selection criteria? Great. Again, I'm checking boxes and I can do I can do conditions with ands and ors. I can do equals greater than. Again, I have I'm writing absolutely no code here. Parameter values. What do we want them to be? All right. Well, I hard coded this one to zero, so I want you know I only want a result if I have you know more than one record or at least one record. Um, my input parameter gets plugged into our CM number field there. Um, it's all very straightforward. And then what do I want to do with the records when I retrieve them? Sticking them in a work variable. And I can work variables are just temporary variables within this API. I can create them to be arrays or variables, whatever I want them to be. I can just stick things into them to be used later. Um, the same process with DB2. It's just instead of connecting to our um, AWS server, in this case, I'm just the default database. I'm running on IBMI, so right now my default database is configured to the local IBMI. So, and then in the, the last step here, I'm just grabbing all of that data that I put into the work variables and putting them into our API output. So again, I've built an API that's calling an RPG program, retrieving data from the cloud, running an AWS, retrieving DB2 data from my IBMI. I could even add another step if I, if I wanted to, although we don't really have time right now, to go out and retrieve some data, say from, yeah, I don't know, a SQL server running locally, or maybe it's running in Azure. Who cares? It can all be pulled into one API and we can run it right here. So if we take a look, I can go to my test tab again and let's just run it. So let's look for 1827. Pretty sure there's data for that one. There we are, ran really quick. And you can see here that I have my response with all of my data coming from the various places. So the, again, the idea here is you know your systems, you know where your data resides, you know where all of these resources are. We're just giving you a tool to be able to pull them all together very easily. You don't have to be an API expert. You don't have to be a Node.js developer even. Um, all you need to do is be able to answer questions and we can help you build the API layer that you need for your applications. So that's a quick run through. I, now, obviously we have some other things and we won't run them, but I mean, for example, this I have this here for to show that the, um, the process can be more complicated. Um, so this uh, particular example where we're actually bringing in a list. You can see here in our input parameters that this is actually has a really complicated structure that comes in as the list. And some of these things are arrays. In fact, you see here where it says multiple, all of these things are arrays. So we are, you know, here you see process primary list. That step is to process a list. So we can, so basically that's a loop. So we have loops, we have conditions, we have all of those in this low code environment so that we can build whatever the logic is for this API um, and have it call programs, go out and retrieve data, process the data that was brought in, manipulate it. All of those things can be done within this point and click environment. And then we can expose that as an API very quickly. Um, so that's a quick overview of the, of the API portion. I know I don't have a ton of time, but there's more to it than this. This is a very holistic solution. So not only can we create and deploy these API very easily, we've also tried to make sure that all of the, all of the things that you're gonna need for a proper API layer are taken care of. So if I come to my API options, the first thing we'll take a look at is our API Explorer. So I mentioned that you know we developers are so great at documentation, right? Um, well, this is, again, as I mentioned, this is going to take care of it for us. So all of the API that I have on this server 
um, has pulled all of those description and label fields out of the forms that we filled out and has gone ahead and built a documentation site for us. So we can come in, we can take a look. Here's all of the information about this particular API, um, even the ability to test it right here in the documentation page. So we can actually run a test even within the documentation, see the output um, and, and all of the uh, things that we filled out. These, these API are categorized um, based on the category fields. So we can, of course, move our way around to find specific API if we want. We can search anything that has, uh, for example, claim. I, I know I would need an API that has something to do with claim. All right, well, here's, here are our APIs that have the word claim somewhere in their documentation. Um, we, can, we can jump around and find what we need. Um, this is all Swagger based or open API, if you will. So not only can I come in and find this stuff, um, let's say you're gonna be consuming this from, uh, let's say .NET, and let's say you have some tooling that can import a Swagger document to scaffold out your API interface. Well, just click this link right here. Here's your Swagger document. Um, you can just give the URL to the Swagger document to whoever's gonna be consuming your API, and they can then take that and use it. So again, easy to do documentation. You don't even have to think about it. All you have to do is fill in the descriptions as you're developing. The last piece, um, you know, we're running an API server on IBM I. That's something new, you know, it's, and it's based on Node.js. So again, that's something for some shops that is going to be very new. So, you know, how do we know that, we're, that it's running well? How do we know that, you know, this isn't eating my system alive? Um, how, do, how do I go and find out if there are errors uh, with my API? Well, again, we thought, we thought of that. So if we take a look at our API dashboard, and you'll see that there's a ton of data here. Um, I've actually, this whole time we've been doing this demo, um, you'll see here, I've actually got uh, Postman hammering away at this uh, API server while we're doing the demo. I know I'm, I'm, I like to live dangerously. Uh, but the point being, I wanted real data for us to see while we're, while we're uh, taking a look at the dashboard. So in the last two hours, roughly, um, I've actually hit this server with 35,000 requests. Now, this is just a default install on an IBM I. I haven't done any tuning. This is straight out of the box. It's performing quite well. Uh, you probably wouldn't have even noticed uh, any, any uh, slowness while we were doing the, the demonstration. Uh, we're processing about seven requests per second. Um, I intentionally put some errors in earlier um, so that we can see that it's, it does show us specifically how many errors we've had. We can take a look at our requests and um, over the last 60 minutes. You can see uh, what we're processing. We can see CPU usage over the last hour. We can see current CPU usage, current memory usage, all of that here just on the summary view. And then we have tabs with all sorts of uh, different uh, metrics for us. So we can take a look at requests by method. We can get into errors. You know, what kind of errors are we getting? Well, when I made these errors, I, I just broke the server basically on purpose. So we got five, we got status 500 errors, so actual server, server errors. We can actually take a look at a list of the errors. So not only do I know the errors happened, now I can come in and say, okay, well, what happened? Well, here we can actually expand this and I have all of the information about the call that caused the error. I know exactly the parameters, I have the bodies, the headers, everything. So I can actually go and recreate this and try to figure out what happened. We can get into long running requests. Again, I have some things that had errors on purpose. So obviously they ran really long. Um, but I can take a look at this and try to find those API that just seem to take a little longer than they should. Uh, maybe it's the parameters that are being passed. And, but I can find that information out right here in the dashboard. Um, rates and durations, we can take a look at trends here as far as you know, how, many, how many requests we're getting per minute, per second, et cetera. Um, payloads, how much data are we sending back and forth? Um, API calls. So this is a list of all of our routes. Uh, and we can take a look. You know, 
for example, this claim cost, the one that's the one that I'm hitting uh, really hard here is the one that's actually talking to multiple databases and calling an RPG program. Um, so I've in the last two hours, I've called that almost 16,000 times. Um, got one currently processing. Oh, I guess it finished. Um, I've had 12 errors. Again, I, I made those happen. But I can see all the information about this API and what it's doing. I can even click on it and get specific information um, about this API and take a look at uh, you know response sizes, um, handle times. Right now, you know, it's averaging 292 milliseconds every time this gets called. Um, we can get to this one gets called the most, so we can again we can see how many requests at deck scores, errors. We we have a 0.02 percent error rate pretty good um obviously you want it to be zero but you know if you got to have an error rate you know hundredths of a percent are is probably pretty good um but again all of this has already been taken care of it's all here so that you don't have to be an expert your admin doesn't have to be an expert to go in and look just look and see how's it doing um it's all been summarized right here so that we can hop in and uh take a quick look now, I had I had not planned to field questions uh, during this break, so I think what we'll do at this point is I will switch back over to my PowerPoint, and I'll just tell you where to get more inf information. So um, I have a whole series of videos that I've done about Profound API that's available on our YouTube channel. You can go out to uh, Profound Logic TV on YouTube and you can uh, find out more. Uh, obviously, our website has information. You can go to profoundlogic.com slash API. You can contact sales if you'd like for someone to walk you through this. Uh, if you need to talk cost, if you need to set up a demo, um, sales at profoundlogic.com, they can set you up uh, with one of, uh, e either myself or one of my solutions architects like Mikey. Um, and we can walk you through this and, uh, and see if it's the right solution for you. So. With that, I'm going to hand this back over to Paul at this point, so he can uh, he can finish up his presentation, and we'll just have some extra time for Q and A uh, once he finishes up. Okay, cool. Um, you went quicker than you told me you were going to, Brian May. Uh, I I did. Um, that was not my intention, but I, I guess it happens sometimes, right? Oh, okay. Well, but better that 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 than going the other way. Think of it. <laughs> True. Think of it that way. Okay, so let me just get my presentation back up here. Oh, where is it gone? Okay. Uh, bu and here we go. Okay, so uh, thanks for that, Brian. Um, I like the times on the server, by the way, it's, it's, it's impressive. I always love to see that when people talk in milliseconds. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so one of the things, if, if, if you're someone who uses, um, embedded SQL a lot, uh, one of the things that you'll be aware of is that, um, uh, SQL never fails. You, you know, it, like it's never going to make your program fail. Now, some, something that you do with your SQL, like, it, you know, if, if you accidentally, you know, you know, call something like a decimal data error when you're shoving something into a data structure or you're overlaying or something like that. Yeah, you, you might, but SQL itself never directly uh, causes a problem. Now, the reason for this is that SQL always assumes that you're going to check whether or not an SQL statement has worked. So you're either going to check SQL code or SQL state. So, so think of it this way. Um, SQL's assumption is that you are, um, uh, you have an E extender, uh, an error extender on everything. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so that you can, you can check, uh, uh, errors when they come back. Um, now, of course, it'd be nice 
if we did check errors when they come back. I mean, that would be the right thing to do, but a lot of the time we don't. Now, also the other issue that I have with this is that really I would like RPG's default error handling to take care of any problems for me. So for example, um, if I had code in a monitor group, um, I would like the monitor to be able to pick up the fact that an, something terrible happened on, on an SQL statement. Like suddenly I wasn't authorized to a table anymore because somebody had changed uh, the security. Well, you can achieve this by writing a, um, a, uh, uh, a simple uh, um, uh, sub-procedure. Um, and by the way, this sub-procedure can be shoved out in a service program. It, it doesn't have to be in the same module or anything like that. Um, and simply all you have to do is call this after any SQL statement where you actually are concerned about whether or not there was an error. So in this case here, obviously I've called it check SQL state. So I do an insert call check SQL state. So if something went wrong on this, effectively my program is going to blow up. So if I had this in a monitor group, monitor would pick it up or if it was in the main line of a program and I had a, a PSSR routine in there, that PSSR routine uh, would be um, activated uh, by the error. Now, by the way, I've also thrown one other little thing in here because I like to double down when I can. And uh, what check SQL state will also do is act the same as a percent end of file. So um, Alina, the question that you had asked, this is one of the possible things that you may want to look at for it. And here is just going to return true if you fit end of file. So in other words, if you had a status of 100, uh, this function uh, would return a value of, uh, of true. Um, now, if you want to, this uh, by the way, is just showing you a snippet of the code that's in there. And quite simply, the way that this works is that it, it uses get diagnostics to retrieve the last SQL state. And depending on the value of SQL state, it's going to send a message back up the call stack. Now, if it's a horrible thing that happened, in other words, you know, something really nasty that's going to happen, well, then the message that it's going to send will be an escape message. The process of sending an escape message means that um, your, uh, the sub-procedure effectively commits suicide, which means that back in the calling program, what's going to happen, sorry, right back here, is that the call to check SQL state will end in error, which will cause the RPG program to fail. Yeah, and that's what, that's what you're grabbing, okay? So if you want to see the, the gruesome detail of that, there's an article I wrote on this out on, um, uh, on IT Jungle. Uh, that's a link to the article out there. And um, by the way, and the code, the full code of this sub procedure is also in the, the handout if, if you want to grab it from there. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about cursors. Um, uh, the example I have here is pretty much the way all of us, I think when we started doing embedded SQL, uh, this is the way that we learned to do cursors. Um, so you would declare the cursor, you open the cursor, you fetch the first row, um, you go into a do while not end of file loop. Yeah, uh, you do whatever you want with the row that you just uh, uh, grabbed, then fetch the next row, loop through the result set, and then close the cursor. And that's the way most of us learned uh, how to, to handle cursors. Um, and really what I would say is that even though there are still times where you will want to do a cursor this way, it's not the best way of processing a result set. A much better way of doing it is to do it using a multi-row fetch. Now, the analogy I always give people with this is, um, is think of it this way. Uh, I, I give a very practical example. So every week here, uh, I have my Irish whiskey delivery. Uh, that pulls up to the back of the house. So it, it's usually about 30 or 40 cases uh, of whiskey, you know, depending how busy a week I've had. And I've got a loading bay out the back. And um, the, uh, this example is the way that I used to do it, that the truck would pull up, the guy would open the back of the truck and he wouldn't help me unload. So I'd go out, I'd get a, I'd get a box, 
uh, of whiskey and I'd bring it inside and put it inside in, in my storeroom and then go out and get the next box. And I'd do that until I bought in all 40 boxes. And then one day I noticed that all of these boxes were actually sitting on a, on a pallet. And I have one of these little uh, hand forklifts. And I asked the guy, I said, you know, do you mind if, you know, if I took the, the pallet as well? And he said, no. So I, instead, I just bought the hand truck out, you know, slipped it into the pallet, you know, pushed down twice so it lifted, then just wheeled the whole lot in and put it inside. And there were my 40 cases in one go. And I think you'll agree, this is a quicker way of getting 40 cases of whiskey from a truck into where they belong, which is in my storeroom. So the equivalent of this with SQL is to do what's known as a multi-row fetch. And to do a multi-row fetch, in what we need to define is a host structure, which is an array. So up here, I define my host structure data. And as you can see, I've given it a dim, and I'm gonna have a thousand elements in this. The other thing I'm gonna need is a work field uh, called in this case, get rows. And I'm going to initialize that to a value. And the value I'm going to initialize to it is the number of elements in my array. So in this example, get rows is going to have a value of a thousand. Okay, the way that this works is I declare my cursor as before. The one difference here, by the way, is that if it wasn't before, if it wasn't a scroll cursor, it needs to be a scroll cursor. We open the cursor as before. But now, instead of saying, give me a row, give me a row, give me a row, what I'm going to say is I want to fetch first, okay, so from the start of the result set for 1000, remember the value that we have in there of get rows, rows into the data structure array. Okay, and that's going to go out and it's going to try and fetch 1000 rows from the result set in one fell swoop into that data structure array. Okay. Now, how many rows did I retrieve? Okay, so I said, give me a thousand, but actually there were only three of them out there. Okay, so um, uh, immediately after the fetch, if I look at the value of the third element of SQL ERRD, which is an array that's in the SQL communications area, that will tell me how many rows were fetched on the fetch. Okay, and then close my cursor and I'm done. Okay. Now, if anybody wants to know, by the way, with a thousand rows, this is somewhere in the region of 20 times faster than doing it a row at a time. Okay, so on average, I find about 20 times faster. The more rows you have, the faster it gets. Okay, so but with a thousand, which I generally think is more than enough to be doing doing on a fetch. Now I know, okay, the next thing that's hitting everybody here, sir, is saying, well, you know, that that's fine, but but what if I had more than a thousand rows that I, I you know in the result set? I mean, that's just going to give me a thousand. Let's say there were you know fifteen hundred out there. Um, well, then I have to change the logic a bit. Okay, because the thing is, when I do a, a multi-row fetch, I can only fetch a definitive, a maximum number of rows. Okay, now, by the way, the absolute maximum uh, that I can fetch is either going to be, you know, 16 meg of storage, which is sort of the maximum size of storage that can be taken up by an RPG array, or one of the sort of bad side effects that we still have with embedded SQL, is that limit of 32,700 and whatever it is, 74, 73? Okay, actually it's one less than what the RPG limit used to be. That, that maximum is still there. So 32 odd thousand um, is still the maximum number of elements that you can have. But again, I would sort of say, especially in an interactive environment, why would you want to fetch more than 32,000 rows at a time? Okay, so, so what do we need to do if we want to fetch, you know, the, if there are going to be more than, in this case, a thousand rows in a result set, um, what would I need to, uh, need to do? Okay, so that's the first thing I've got to decide is this thing about what this fetch is and the different options that you have. Okay, so 
most people are aware of fetch next and you might know about fetch prior which is allows you to fetch the um uh the uh you know to move the cursor back up in other words like a, a read prior uh, in rpg the big one though uh, that we need to use is this one fetch relative um now fetch relative is an interesting one because uh a lot of people immediately when they see it and my inclination when i first saw it i said oh this is like the relative record number on a subfile. That's what it is. And no, it's not. It is not a relative record number. What fetch relative is, is that you are fetching a row relative to the current position of the cursor. So if I opened a cursor and I said fetch relative five, I'm going to read the fifth row in the result set. In other words, when I open the cursor, the cursor is positioned at zero relative five is five from that. So I would read the fifth row. If I immediately said fetch relative five again, I would now fetch the 10th row. In other words, five from where the cursor is currently positioned. Okay. Now, when you think about this, you start going, oh, well, this is gonna be this thing. I have to keep track of where the cursor is. And the answer to this is no you don't, okay? And this is because there is a very simple way that you always process um, SQL uh, and the way that you always do these, these fetches, okay? And that is that you're always gonna be starting from position zero. Ah, okay, so hopefully tweaked interest here. Okay, so let, let's, let's talk about how this is going to work. Okay, so, um, the first thing is I'm going to have a little uh, uh, data structure, a template here that I'm going to use to help control what rows uh, I want to fetch. And as you can see, there are three, va three uh, variables in here, from row, for rows, total rows. Okay, so the first two are values that I'm going to give to a, a sub procedure that's going to return rows to me. And um, in other words, I'm going to say I want to fetch a certain number of rows, four rows. So for example, I want to fetch 50 rows and the from row from row number 25 in the result set, yeah? And what's gonna come back to me is the total number of rows that are in the result set will be in this structure. Now I'm also gonna get the number of rows that are returned you know, on the, on, the, on the fetch itself, but it's also, you know, just out, out of politeness gonna tell me the total number of rows that are there. Um, now, a side effect of the way that this works is that actually the from row and the for rows might also be adjusted as well. Because let's be honest, I could make a mistake here. Okay, so I could say, oh yeah, I want 100 rows from row number 201, please. But since there are only 72 rows in the result set, me asking for, you know, from row 201 is a little bit silly. Okay, so what would happen is that from row will be reset to one, okay? Now, this is just to show you a little example of the way sort of using this multi-row fetch with embedded SQL uh, would work. So here's uh, my host structure. Um, and uh, just since I mentioned so files earlier, I'm going with the uh, 999999 in here uh, for it. And I'm going to set here, you know, I'm going to, going to fetch the first 100 rows. So I'm going to say I want from row is one, um, you know, uh, for 100 rows. I'm going to call a sub procedure that's going to do all of the SQL. I'm going to look at this in a second now. I'm going to pass in page data, which is that structure up there, and my array. And what's going to come back is the number of rows in the array. Yeah. Now, since I've only asked for 100, that's going to be any value from zero to 100 coming back. Assuming that I'd gotten the full 100 rows, if I wanted to get the next page, I would just add the four rows, like 100, to the from row, yeah, and call it again. And I will now get the second 100 rows, yeah, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is how I would page through. If you want to think of this in a loop going through, is the way that it would work. This is what the sub procedure looks like. So here's our procedure interface. I've called it calc, and here is the structure coming through. Okay. We declare the cursor. So we do whatever the logic is for the cursor that we, we need to use. We open the cursor. 
I do a get diagnostics to get the total number of, um, of rows, okay? And um, I shove that into the data structure, okay? And now I'm gonna call this little sub procedure here called calculate row data. Now, the way, this is gonna be the same for everything that I ever write. All it's doing is playing with the data that's up here in calc. In other words, what it's checking is that the data that I'm looking for, in other words, that the for row and the from row, for the for rows and the from row are within the boundary of that result set. And if not, it's gonna change the values, okay? And then we do a fetch relative. We just do a fetch relative, okay, from that row for that number of rows into our array, okay? We grab the number of rows we retrieved, that's got rows, we close the recursor and we return the number of rows. So all of the data is in the array and we return the number of rows. Now this is the process every time we call. So every time we call, we open the cursor, uh, sorry, we declare the cursor, open the cursor, okay? And since we're doing that, it means the cursor's always at zero. Okay, we calculate the offset for the first row we need to retrieve, retrieve the rows, close the cursor, and then return. Now, if it's a thing that you're thinking, you're saying, oh, hang on, isn't that going to be a terrible overhead because we're constantly opening and closing the cursor? You know, isn't that like opening and closing a file in RPG? The answer is no, it's not. It's not the same as, uh, uh, as opening and closing a file in RPG. When you close a cursor, it's what's known as a soft close. In other words, the cursor doesn't go away. So when you come around again and you declare and open the cursor a second at a time, it's just like flipping a switch. Everything is already defined. In other words, it doesn't have to define a new open data path. It just uses the one that's already there. Okay? It is blindingly fast. Is it an overhead? Yes. Is it a measurable overhead? I, I maybe, but I've never been able to manage uh, to actually figure that out myself. Okay, so in terms of the process, it's pretty much like anything. You we declare the cursor, we open the cursor, get the total number of rows in the result set. This is the extra little bit where we call this sub procedure called calculate row data. Okay, and that's just to make sure that everything is within the boundaries of the result set. And then we fetch that page of rows, you know, that hundred rows or whatever we're asked for. Okay, grab the number of rows we retrieved and close the cursor. And this is what I've just shown you there, by the way, uh, just going back to this. This is every embedded SQL uh, cursor process that I write. This is it. The only thing that ever changes in here is the SQL statement and obviously the definition of the structure that I'm fetching into. Otherwise, this is a template. Okay. Now, by the way, just for completion, this is uh, that calculate row data routine. As you can see, it's, it's a very small little simple procedure and it's just checking uh, the boundaries uh, of everything uh, to make sure they're, uh, they're okay. Okay. Since we're talking about multi-row fetches and cursors, by the way, one of the other things people often want to do is to do a position two in a result set. Um, and uh, the way that you do this is you use one of the um, OLAP functions. Okay? And this is this little guy down here called row number over. So if you think of it this way, if I have a result set with say a thousand rows, and let's say in this, as in this example here, it's sequenced by employee number. And I'm going to give you an employee number, um, you know, uh, employee number, you know, A2165. And I want to retrieve 100 rows from that employee number. Well, if you think about it, really what I need to do is figure out, well, where exactly in the result set is that employee number? In other words, what is the offset number where that row is? Or if that row doesn't exist, what is the next highest number in that result set? So I do this with a separate SQL statement. And what I'm selecting here is the employee number. 
and using this row number over order by employee number, what that's going to put on every row in the result set is the number of the row. So in the first row in the result set, it will be one, two in the second, three in the third, four in the fourth, etc. And that's the one that I want to grab. So I do this in a CTE, a common table expression. And then from that common table expression, I select okay, the value that was generated in there for the first row where the employee number is greater than or equal to whatever you request or whatever the employee number is that you requested. Okay, so this value that I now have in position row is the first row that I need. This is my offset to the first row that I need to retrieve uh, when I do my multi-row fetch. So in my multi-row fetch, I fetch from position row for however many rows I want. And then just to finish up on this, as well as a multi-row uh, fetch, you can also do a multi-row insert. So multi-row insert is where you've built up information, uh, in this case here in the order detail array. So here I have an order header and an order detail. And what I'm keeping is a count of how many of these I've filled. So I'm allowing up to a thousand, but let's say I filled 60 of them. If I'd fill 60, well then num order details has a value of 60. And uh, what will happen here is I'm going to insert the header. And if the, that worked okay, well then I'm going to insert into the order detail table, host variable number of order details, which is 60. I'm gonna insert 60 rows. The values is that data structure array. So the first 60 elements of that array will be inserted into the table. Okay, so it's sort of the reverse of a multi-row fetch. It is a multi-row uh, insert. And by the way, when you see it coded like this, um, uh, things like commitment control are a little bit uh, um, easier uh, to see. Okay, so just before I open this up to um, any questions, um, I'd just like to, uh, to thank you, everybody for their time and attention. Um, and uh, just to remind people that if you want to know more about all of this embedded SQL and everything, uh, coming up, we do have our workshop series coming up and you can check out the details of that um, on the website. Uh, okay. Paul, before you hand over back to Brian and open the general Q&A, you have three questions uh, outstanding in the uh, Q&A. Okay. Uh, um, so they're all concerned with basically, I think, with the same thing that people are asking about. Like David Gibbs said, well, what if you have a thousand and one rows? What will the loop look like if there's more than a thousand rows? And uh, somebody else commented that they always do fetch from and it always starts from the first row. Is fetch first something new? Uh, no, fetch, no, fetch first was always there. Um, the uh, pop up. So hang on a second. I'm just looking at, let me look, look at the questions. So um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, uh, to, the best, to, to the best of my memory, I'm sorry, I would need to check the manual because it's been a long time since I, since I actually looked at, looked at the manual for this. If I remember correctly, fetch first is the default on a fetch. Okay. Um, so, uh, but normally when, when, when we uh, are, sorry, fetch next is normally the default, not fetch first. Uh, so when you do a fetch first, it's normally, um, uh, uh, or sorry, yeah, when you do a fetch first, it's usually four mm rows is usually the syntax uh, 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 with it. Um, uh, okay, so hopefully I've answered that was that if there is more than a thousand elements, uh, you just keep calling it, it it's in a loop. Um, by the way, I, I threw the 999 in there. And uh, again, this is a little bit, uh, if you think about it, uh, the question about sort of going, well, what happens if there's more than a thousand rows was the same question people had with subfiles when they said, well, what happens if there's more than like 9,999 rows that you want to shove in the subfile? And the answer was, well, you can't. I mean, you have a physical limit there. So you have to change your, your program logic. Okay. So the example I had on the code of the calling there where I said, oh, this is how you would fetch the next page. Yeah. In other words, add 100 uh, to your starting and, and just call it again. And it will now give you the second 100. Add 100, call it again. 
And that's one of the reasons it returns to you the total number of rows in the result set. But if you want to check that logic, well, the total number of rows is what's controlling your, your loop. That's how you know that you have no more uh, calls uh, to do. Um, okay. Um, okay, I see the user in the stream, but the sub user uh, match the columns back for me. Okay, so in answer to that, the qualified data structure with the dim of uh, 2000, but the subfields in the data structure match the columns bought back. Yes, this is, this is a requirement. Um, it, it, in other words, sorry, the names don't have to match, but you're doing a fetch into a host structure. So if it's a thing that I am, uh, I'm going that in my select statement, I have five columns, well, then my host structure has to have five columns and the types of those columns have to match whatever I'm fetching. Uh, otherwise, uh, doesn't make sense. Um, uh, okay. Um, and by the way, the, the names, sorry, the names in the structure, if that, that was what, what you were asking, no, they don't have to be the same. Uh, just coincidentally, they, they were here. It's, I like to keep my names uh, constant. Okay. So um, with that, um, I think we can open it up for, for any questions. Um, I don't know if there were any questions coming in uh, for Brian uh, as we went through there um, uh, that Brian may want to uh, answer or that, but. I, I, I like this. I think we explained things so perfectly, Brian. That's uh, okay. That again, can... no questions. <laughs> It's been so long since I've seen you, I can just stare into your eyes for a little while, Paul. <laughs> Moving on very quickly. <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. So um, let's see. Did, were there any questions I needed to answer? Uh, Mikey, were there any, was there anything that I should address? Uh, I know you were answering questions in the chat. There's, there's a question just come in about security, Brian, but I'm not sure if he's asking it about your product or Paul's SQL. <laughs> uh, so security, uh, I mean, I can talk about it in our product. Uh, I didn't do it in the demonstration, but yes, we have authentication um, available for for all of the API that, that are there. You can do... Um, you can do token-based authentication. You can do uh, user password authentication. If it's not in the current release, it, it will be. Um, there actually will be IBMI uh, authentication if you want to go that route with your API. Um, personally, not a fan, but if that's what you got to do, um, that it, that's available too. Um, even to the point that uh, with a little bit of configuration, it can use things like OAuth. So you know, whatever whatever type of uh, authentication and security you want to use there it's all uh, it's all available if that's if if you were asking me hey uh brian uh i uh, I, I did answer most of the questions out there but one out there that i kind of was probably a little more fuzzy on was yes. as you were showing the steps as you're building the api right the the, the low code steps uh can you put more than one step to be run simultaneously asynchronously uh you know in your in your and I, I think I know the answer to that, but I want to go to the I want to go to the source on this one. <laughs> oh, please. I don't know if you're going to the source, um, but uh, so in the low code environment, no. The one thing that I that I, is important to point out though is you can write code in Profound API, so you can have a step that runs custom Node.js code. So if you wanted to run something in parallel like that, you could add a step and then that you could write your own Node.js code to actually go and do those things in parallel. Um, so it, it's, it's an option, but it, it's not going to be point and click. Um, it's gonna take a little, a little bit of coding. We, I mean, we are developers. I can't take all of the fun out of your lives. <laughs> okay. You've got a question, Brian, about monitoring data. The monitoring data for the APIs, uh, is it available for you to analyze and create custom dashboards? Um, currently, and, and again, remember this is, this is V1. And if you know anything about our products, you know that we're constantly adding new features. Uh, we kind of had to draw a line in the sand. So 
at this point, that data is, um, is held in memory. And I think there may be an API to retrieve it, um, but it's not, it's not stored you know, like in a log file that you can go out and play with yet. Um, there, there, we're, we're talking about that. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's one of those things that's on the, on the list. Um, and of course, I think I saw Scott Roach, who's our developer, um, lingering around here. So he may actually just yell at me after this and tell me, oh, that, that's already done or, oh, I wasn't going to do that. But I, I guess I've kind of, uh, put but, him in the corner now. But, but with that said, <laughs> be careful what you ask for, because sometimes these services really do get hammered. And if you're logging this to a table or a series of tables, those tables can get big really, really quick. And it's it's kind of surprising how that happens. Or or it could get they can get big over a period of time if you're not keeping an eye on that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, you, you can end up with a world of hurt. But yep. So um so let's see here. Uh, I actually I hey, look at me. I noticed one. Um, does Profound API run in the cloud only, or can it run on our local um, IBMI? It can run anywhere. Uh, Profound API is actually platform agnostic. Um, so it runs on IBMI, but it can run on any platform anywhere at all. So you could have Profound API running um, on, on anything. Uh, it, it's, it's all Node.js based. It's based on Node.js and Express, um, which, you know, it's completely um, portable. So if you, so, and that's important. So I was running it on IBMI and a lot of our customers choose to do that. If you don't want to put the API workload on your IBMI, you can put it on something else and just have it access your IBMI. It can actually reach out to your IBMI even though it's running on a different system. Paul, have you seen this one for you? Uh, yeah, so I'm not not quite I, quite sure I, I understand. Um, uh, the, okay, so you've done multi role fetches before. Okay, um, okay, not create a loop. <laughs> so um, sorry, the question just disappeared on me. Oh, sorry, <laughs> that's it's it's under answered. Okay, so I, I flagged oh, well, it that you would. Then, so I flagged I flagged <laughs> oh, it that you were okay. addressing it live. Um, okay, so so the, the DB two row count on the get diagnostics the, the DB two row count returns to you the total number of rows in the result set. So if it's a thing that you're issuing the same statement every time, that's never going to change. It's always the total number of rows, as opposed to the number of rows that you fetched. Um, no, I'm, I'm actually, maybe it's a thing if you do get diagnostics after a multi-role fetch, the DB2 row count will give you the number of rows that you fetched. So uh, in case, yeah, that going forward, it's it's thing. Is there a performance difference uh, on that on the fetch? No, the, the, the performance difference on this is the difference between a multi-role fetch and a single role fetch. Multi-role fetch, as I said, for about a thousand rows, on average, about 20 times faster. Okay, um, well, we, we, we've run a little bit past our allotted time um, of an hour and 15 minutes. So um, I'm just gonna say uh, thank you. Um, so Brian and Mikey in the background, good minion, by the way, he's a very good minion. <laughs> if you've got to have one, that's, what, that's one to have. Yeah, so um, it, well, much, good better, much better than well. my one. So thank you everybody for tuning in. Uh, remember, we have a, uh, another Lunch and Learn coming up, uh, coming up next Tuesday. Um, and uh, you know where to find us. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know if you have a handout for this, by the way, um, uh, Brian, but I, I think everybody is going to be getting an email from, from Profound anyway. And if so, there'll be oh, details about anything you want to, want to find uh, in there. Um, the recording for this will be available um, tomorrow. Um, so if you just go back to where you registered for the Lunch and Learn, um, you, uh, you will see there will be a button there that allows you to listen to the recording. And I'm sure Profound will be telling you where you can find the, uh, the recording as well. So uh, without further ado, um, I will bid you all um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or good night, depending which part of the world that you're in. And uh, look forward, hopefully, to seeing some of you um, online again next week. Brian, Mikey, thank you. Thank, thank you, guys. You.